Hello, I am Fantastic and Fantastic, and today I'm going to be doing something a little new. I'm going to be doing a Chronomagia New Player Introduction Guide. So, Chronomagia is the newest game to be released by Gung Ho, and in essence, it's a digital card trading card game. And basically, the idea of the game is it basically revolves around intelligently playing creatures, spells, and using your Magia skills to defeat your opponent with a 20 card deck. Now, Gung Ho has released an official beginner's guide. However, like I do feel that having my own twist or take on things can be meaningful because it will cover topics or strategies that are not um, showcased in that beginner's guide. So this game was released on April 9th, 2018. So it's obviously very new. And because of that, we're on basically the cutting edge of what is current. And furthermore, the Japanese and North American English servers, they're in sync. So there's no like, massive waiting times there's no distinct advantage of playing one server or the other just play the one that you're familiar with so with all that being said i'm not sure how popular this game will become however if it's made by gung ho there's a strong likelihood that it's well produced um that has strong financial backing so i do feel like the game will take off and it is advantageous to obviously start the game right now because like I said, the game is new, so you don't really have any catch-up time. And in all honesty, with any trading card game out there, the sooner you start the, upon the game's release, the easier it is to basically become assimilated into the kind of the culture, so to speak. Because let's say, for example, you played Hearth, wanted to play Hearthstone. There are thousands of cards now available, and it's going to be a lot more daunting by comparison to what Chrono has in store for us. So if this game does take off and it proves to be successful in terms of content creation-wise, I might produce more in the future. So first things first, re-rolling. So re-rolling is a very common term or strategy used when playing any type of mobile game because it allows you to basically reset um, your game until you actually start with something meaningful. Now, in the case of Chrono, you have the ability to obviously reset until you gain a pack of cards that has something meaningful. But if you start right now, you're basically gonna get like 11 packs immediately. So you can basically just do those 11 packs and provide you rolled something at least decent or at least a couple decent cards you should just stick with that because you can basically craft cards in the future and in all honesty we don't know where the meta is going to take us so you don't necessarily need to have those like considered like strong legendaries because those might shift and change as more strategies emerge now if let's say you start this game and we didn't have that extra 10 pack start and you roll five common cards from your first pack well then you should probably restart so just keep that in mind. Get a, a few rares and maybe super rares, and you should be honestly fine moving forward. So basically, there is a lot of terminology in every game, and Chrono is no exception. So I'm basically going to be highlighting what I feel are the more common terms that are being thrown around, as well as shedding some light on what they mean. So basically, the deck is what the game somewhat revolves around. And basically, the idea is you're going to be trying to craft a deck that has 20 cards that can basically carry you to victory. So each deck can only have up to two duplicates of any given card at a time. However, legendaries have another subtle restriction. You can have two legendary cards in your deck. However, only one of them can be in play at a time. So for example, let's say you have XYZ legendary card and you have one in play and you have another one in your hand. You can't play the one in your hand while there's another one already in play. Just a small subtle thing, but you can use two of each in that. Um, mindset. Now another good thing about the game is you can obviously swap cards in and out very quickly so as you open up new packs and gain new toys you can assimilate them into your decks quite easily. So another thing is like you start the game with four cards in your hand and then your first turn you draw so you have five cards so al already you've gone through 25% of your deck so the games actually go quite quickly which is nice because you don't have to suffer through a terrible slog if it's going badly against you. So Cards come in four different rarities. They come in Legendary, L, Super Rare, SR, R is Rare, and Common is C. And these symbols can be found in the top right-hand corner of each card. So in this image here, this is a Legendary card. So just keep that in mind. And for the most part, the rarity does provide some insight as to the strength of the card. But again, a well-crafted well deck will outbeat or outperform a deck of just random legendaries thrown in because you want to have synergy for your deck and your magia skills which i'll explain about in a moment so the play screen can be overwhelming because there's obviously a lot of information to process and this image was taken from the official gung ho page and i'm basically going to be explaining all of the numbers and what they mean if they are relevant so magia points or mp is designated by the two and 
eight numbers. So basically it's the green circle. And basically that is the currency used to play creatures, spells, and utilize some magia skills. And you gain a certain amount of MP back every single turn at the start of your turn. So you don't have to use every single MP that you have. You can basically bank it up and save it for future turns in order to play a more powerful or expensive card. So that is important because unlike other games like say Hearthstone, which is I want to have more experience with, you have to basically try and use up as much mana as possible every turn because it's fully replenished at the start. Whereas this game here, you only get say like four every turn, so you can bank it up to make big power plays in the future. So sometimes it is advantageous to keep some in reserve, don't overplay everything because then they can be vulnerable of course. Uh, four and ten are the life of your gifted. So gifted is basically who you are. And the idea is you want to reduce it, your opponent's gifted down to zero health or zero life. And once that occurs, the game is over and then a winner is declared. So this is important because you want to obviously want to keep track of your health because it's kind of like a currency, so to speak. Some cards or abilities want you to sacrifice your gifted's health in order to utilize them. So Obviously, take those with a grain of salt, don't overplay those. But another important thing to keep in mind is every time a gifted takes damage, they will actually gain mana equal to the damage suffered. So let's say I did five damage to my opponent's gifted. Well, that means they're going to actually gain five mana right away. And then on the next turn, they regenerate mana as well. So you could potentially give your opponent lots of MP very quickly, which can be a little dangerous overall. I might say mana or um, magia points interchangeably. It's really magia points, but they have the same abbreviation of MP, which can be confusing. Defense is number three and number nine. And that's basically kind of like this weird shield-like thing with a number on it. And basically, defense is a specialized trait utilized by various gifted um gifted and essentially what it means is that it reduces all incoming damage by the value designated by the shield or defense so let's say from the above example the your gifted actually has three defense that means all attacks of three or less are actually going to be completely reduced down to zero so that's important because it allows you to actually survive longer and prevents little things from picking away at your health so that is meaningful and important the gifted are number one and seven, basically the, the two like big characters that are animated and moving. Basically each gifted has a unique skill set and characteristics as well as attributes and stat distribution. So again, you pick the one that's either more favorable for your cards or the play style you enjoy using. And last but not least, we have number six, and that is your skill gear. And your skill gear is basically what influences your magia skills or basically kind of like your hero power, so to speak. So each Gifted has actually nine different magia skills possibly available in three distinct tiers, and each tier has three different magic and three different magia skills available. So you basically want to customize it to basically the liking or needs for your team and deck composition. So that is important because you can't just use any random deck with any random magia skills. You need to have synergy, and I'll explain more of them later as we progress through this article slash video. So then next I'm going to jump to creatures. Again, I'll, explain, I'll come back to this at a future time. So creatures are basically the characters that you're, you, the gifted, can summon to basically battle your opponent. And each one has a unique array of abilities and stat distributions, and I'm going to just explain them briefly here as well. So when you first play a creature, you have to set the creature. So what this means is when you set a creature, you spend your magia points to actually play it, and then it's played face down on the playing field with um, little balls representing how much magia points was spent to play it. So when a creature is set, your opponent has no idea what it is outside of the magia point cost to play it, and it's somewhat, it's basically kind of invulnerable because it's in play but not really in play. You can't interact with it in any way, shape, or form. You can't attack it. You can't debuff it you can't buff it you have to wait till it actually becomes summoned which occurs at the start of your next turn so summoning a creature is basically having a creature go through that set phase so on turn one i play xyz creature it's now set on the board at the start of my turn two it would actually become summoned and then it can take actions and be interacted with afterwards so it's very important to realize that summoning and setting a creature are two different things and understanding how they work is important to victory and I'll explain more of it as we go into more advanced strategies in this video. So creatures at a glance. So I just pulled one random creature out. It's a legendary which makes it more exciting. So in the top, at the very top it tells you the name of the card, so pretty straightforward. And then you have the magia point cost to actually play the card. So this one requires 10 magia points to play. The rarity is displayed in the top right corner as designated by the L for legendary. It has type two different typings, and again, I'll explain that a little bit further. It has an attack value and a health value. 
Some attacks have additional effects, most of them by default have none. And then this area here is their special ability or skill. So this usually occurs when you actually play the creature. And in this case here, she's able to basically upon summoning, so that means after setting and after it's flipped over, it will destroy all creatures with a cost of six or less. So incredibly powerful legendary. So basically I just kind of explained each of those a little bit already. And another thing to keep in mind is vanilla stats. So basically vanilla stats is a way to kind of abbreviate a card's um, stats, so to speak. So basically in the case here, it'll be a four slash six. 10 MP cost card. So that's a way to kind of visualize it. So you obviously have to think, well, it costs 10 and only has four, six for stat distribution. It has to have something pretty magical, which is their um, special ability or skill when you play it. Sometimes people might refer to it as like battle cries because that's a Hearthstone term and Hearthstone is a very well established trading card game. Now, here are some miscellaneous terms that do occur as well. So stealth. So stealth basically means a creature is invisible. You can see what the creature is, you just can't interact with it if you are the opponent. So for example, my opponent played a creature who is stealth. So basically they set it and then it became summoned, now it's stealthed. I can see what it is, I can see what it does, but I cannot target it directly or interact with it. I can still deal damage to it if I have abilities that um, hit all opposing creatures or hit random creatures, but it will just be there. I can't actually touch it. So stealth has lots of value because it allows you to unlock your Magia skills without actually running the risk of it, the card being removed. And I'll explain a bit more of Magia skills in the future. So it is a powerful mechanic if you can use it properly. Taunt is basically forcing all creatures to hit that one before they can target other ones. If you have multiple taunt creatures, you can choose which taunt one you want to attack. So taunt basically is a way to protect your other more vulnerable creatures or your actual gifted itself. Just something to keep in mind when building your deck. Rush is a special effect for creatures. And basically what it means is that a creature completely bypasses the set phase. So as soon as you play it, it's set and then it becomes summoned immediately. So that means you can take actions right away. So this is a way to kind of surprise your opponents, so to speak, because you then right, suddenly have damage already on the board. You may unlock your Magia skills as well as just suddenly overwhelming your opponent. Now, to kind of compensate for this, Creatures that have this rush ability tend to be a little more expensive from the Magia point perspective because, again, you get to use them immediately. But then again, you want to make sure you get as much value out of them as possible because you don't have to wait. Level up summoning. So this is a very exciting mechanic within Chrono Magia, in my opinion, because it opens up lots of different doors for playstyles. So basically, level up summoning is the process of paying one additional Magia point or MP to play the creature from your hand on top of an existing summoned creature. Doing this will result in the base creature being kind of deleted or erased and granting additional stats to the creature that you just played from your hand. So basically if you play perform a level up summon on a creature that's already in the board, the newly summoned creature will become level two. If you perform a level up summon on a level two creature, the new creature played becomes level three. And you will gain bonus stats for the new creature. You don't absorb any of their other attributes or abilities or special um, active skills. Instead, you gain either one attack, two life, or you'll gain two attack and four life. So basically, it's a way for you to basically empower your creatures and make them significantly stronger. So even a weak creature will gain sizable amounts of stats when you perform a level up summon. And I'll explain a bit more advanced tactics for level up summons further down, but that's the general gist of how it works. Now we have some miscellaneous terms I want to cover as well. We have the graveyard. Basically, after a card has been played, utilized, or discarded, or killed in action, they basically are pushed into your graveyard. And for the most part, those cards are out of play. However, some specific cards allow you to interact with your graveyard. Maybe you can bring them back into your hand or put them in play. Just bear in mind that only certain cards can. Not all decks will be able to utilize or interact with your graveyard. Obliterate is a very special way to remove a card. Basically, if a card is obliterated, it is permanently removed from play. There's no way to bring it back. You can't, um, if you obliterate a card from your opponent, it's removed. They can't bring it back from either like any Magia skills or spells or creatures who have special effects. It's gone, it's removed. It can be very powerful and it's a permanent removal. Obviously at the start of your next game, you have those cards back. So don't worry, those cards aren't destroyed from your collection. Shields. So shields are a special mechanic that basically enable a creature to gain um, basically some level of fortification. Basically, it's kind of like the defense for your gift except slightly different. It basically will reduce any incoming damage 
If it's one or two damage, the damage is completely voided. However, damage of three or more will break the shield and then allow the creature to be damaged normally. So throwing shields up on creatures is a great way to make them survive longer because let's say you have a one health creature, but it has a shield. Now you need to have at least a creature um, three damage to actually remove it. Otherwise it doesn't actually die. Fixed damage. Fixed damage can be almost thought of as like true damage. Basically, if something says it's going to deal XYZ amount of fixed damage, that's the exact amount of damage it's going to deal. It does not get reduced or resisted by defense, by shield. It just does that exact amount. So fixed damage is obviously very desirable because it allows you to bypass lots of mechanics that you would not otherwise be able to. Stun. So if a creature is stunned, it's unable to perform an action. However, it can be interacted with. That means you can attack a stunned creature, their taunts are still in place, and you can still perform level up summons on top of them. So their ma and also their typings are still active, so their magia skills can still work. So stunning a creature basically just disables it for the given turn. It can be useful, it kind of helps buy yourself a little bit of extra time. Stone is a status effect that removes a creature from play for a turn. The creature is still on the board, but cannot be interacted with. It can't be hurt, it can't take damage, it can't be attacked, it can't be targeted. Also, their taunts are temporarily disabled. So if you have an opponent with a massive taunt and you want to hit their gifted to finish the game, you play a, ta um, a stone ability creature that basically kind of, quote unquote, like turns off their taunt and turns off that creature. Then you can kind of go for their gifted's face and deal damage. So stone is a very powerful way to kind of buy yourself additional time like stuns. Lethal is a term that basically expresses that you can end the game. So if you are holding lethal in your hand, that means you have enough damage to deal to their gifted to basically end the game and win. Now this is important because you don't want to miss your lethal. If you have a lethal turn, you want to take it because you want to end the game. There's no point in pro prolonging the suffering overall. Like You just want to end and win. So just count all the damage you have available and how much you can possibly do to your opponent. If you have lethal, say, next turn, set it up. Try and do as much damage as possible to whittle them down into the threshold you need to actually kill and finish them off. Now, there are two distinct currencies in Chrono Magia. There is Magia Gold, and basically it's the premium currency. Basically, Magia Gold is used to purchase additional card packs, which basically builds up your card collection, gives you more roster depth and things that you can play with. You can earn Magia Gold slowly over time by completing achievements or login bonus, but you can always purchase them with real life money, which is basically IAPing in app purchases. Next is, um, well, actually, one last thing is that it's usually advisable to spend your Magia Gold on the 10 pack bundle because you guarantee yourself at least a super rare card, and there's no discount. There's no discount otherwise, but you might as well give yourself every little bit of help you can possibly get. Suit pieces are basically the other kind of currency, but you cannot IAP for this currency directly. Suit pieces are, are basically the four different suits, like there's hearts, clubs, spades, and diamonds. And basically, these are used to basically craft or unlock creatures or cards, as well as unlock new gifted to control. Now, for the most part, you can't obviously purchase them directly, but breaking down duplicate cards you have will yield suit pieces, as well as completing quests and achievements or login bonuses. So. Everyone will have access to suit pieces over time, and that's how you can craft specific cards. However, breaking down a card is a permanent action. Basically, if you break down a card, it's gone and removed from your collection forever. So don't break down any cards unless you have numerous duplicates of them because you can use two per deck and you don't want to actually accidentally break down something you only had one or two copies of and be unable to utilize the full amount in your given decks. So. Now that the terminology is all out of the way, what constitutes a good card? So, despite Chrono Magia being a very newly released game, a lot of knowledge can be applied from other deck building games and is easily transferable. So, when looking at a card, the rarity does obviously indicate a certain degree of potency or power, but we need to understand why those cards are powerful. So, we need to basically be able to assess what, what makes a card good in a vacuum. Basically taking into consideration no other factors whatsoever and whether or not it actually has merit. So we look for value from a card because we want to basically play a card that can trade up, so to speak. So basically when you play a card, it gives you more value either for the ma Magia point cost or it can remove two or more cards from your opponent. Because like I said, this game only has 20 cards. The games can be over quite quickly. If you're able to trade up or trade favorably over time, you are going to come out ahead because you have card advantage. By that, I mean, let's say you play this card, which is one of the stronger legendary cards in the game. 
For 10 magia points, obviously it's very expensive, you can remove up to three enemy creatures immediately with her special ability or skill, as well as attack for four damage. So in theory, you could remove four cards with a single play. That's incredible value, but obviously has traded up. And that's what we wanna look for. We wanna find ways for cards to trade up. Basically, because if over time, let's say I'm able to basically out trade my opponent 11 to nine, it, I could play nine cards to remove 11 of theirs, and they played obviously 11 to remove nine of mine. I've come out ahead. I have card advantage, and over time, I should win, provided I didn't fall too far behind on either board control or my gifted's health. Now, being having great value or trading up is not obviously exclusive to legendary creatures. They just often give you a chance to trade up, provided certain scenarios are met. But if we look at this common mimic, common is the most basic and low-level card available. It is actually very powerful. It costs two magia points to play, has one attack, one health, but its summoning effect allows you to deal two damage, two fixed damage to a creature directly in front of it. So this is great because you just suddenly dealt two damage, you get one damage from attacking, and if your magia skills rely on diamonds or constructs, you could possibly do more damage. So from the example of Mimic, if you are playing Karen, which is one of the free gifteds you start with, you are going to have the ability to do three damage with the Mimic, one from its summoning effect, as well as one damage from its basic attack, and also two more damage from your Magia skill. So basically do five damage for the cost of two Magia points. Very good value. It's a very nice way to trade up because they might have spent more Magia points to remove this card overall, or you could remove a card that costs significantly more than that. So it's another way to trade up. You basically make your opponent waste more Magia points than you did for playing cards. So now we come to Magia skills and creature typing. So like I said before, each gifted has three tiers of Magia skills with each tier having three distinct abilities within them. So you obviously have numerous different compositions available for yourself and it's great because it adds replay value for your game and also allows you to use various different strategies and synergies. So from this above image here, you are able to deal two damage to one enemy for the cost of just one Magia point. There's no type restriction, however, if we look at this skill set here, this shoulder slice also does two damage to one enemy, but it requires you to have a diamond creature in play. So both accomplish the exact same goal, but one requires you to spend a Magia point, but has no restriction, whereas the other one requires you to actually have a diamond type creature in play in order to deal that damage. So depending on the type of deck you're building, you obviously want to make sure this skill set here, you have lots of diamond creatures because that way you're able to basically cast shoulder slice for free all the time, provided that like, so for example, we use that mimic who is a diamond and then we have the shoulder slice. You can cast shoulder slice for free, provided the mimic is alive on your turn. So. This is important. Now, you want to make it your goal to try and cast your level one spell as often as possible. But you obviously want to start thinking about, can I activate level two or level three? Now, level two requires me to have a spade, a diamond, and a construct. And then her level three requires the spade, diamond, and construct, but also another diamond. So lots of creatures can have multiple typings. This mimic here has diamond and construct, which means that I could cast tier two if I have just at least one spade also present. So you keep that in mind when you're deck building. But regardless of what magia skill you can use on your turn, you only can use one per turn. So obviously make sure you choose the one that you can use the most easily, like basically choose the most powerful one or the right one for the situation. Now, this is very important because Obviously, you want to build a deck based around the Magia skills for the typing that you can utilize. So now we're going to look at level up summoning and kind of more advanced tactics. So basically, the idea is you are able to upgrade an exist, uh, basically upgrade a creature from your hand by kind of sacrificing a base card and one additional Magia point for either at level two, one attack, two health. Level three is two attack and four health. So this is important for two distinct reasons. It, allay, it basically enables low. Um, MP costing creatures to have more value because they're basically used as a sacrificial base to make your more powerful cards even stronger, or it allows you to preserve a card that's expended its usefulness. So enabling low Magia point creatures. So basically from that above example, that Mimic only costs two Magia points and has a pretty good value overall, but you don't really want to leave a 1-1 one, one alive on the board because it's going to be picked off by virtually any type of mechanic in the game. So the idea is you play that Mimic chest and then you get its benefit, get its effect, and then you level up summon over top of it. Therefore, you only spent basically two Magia points for the Mimic, one for this level up summon, and now your 
more expensive creature is now more powerful than it was beforehand. So it's a great way to have nice deck diversity because you want to have some low cost creatures for the sacrifice, sacrificial purpose of level up summoning. Now, the other usage for level up summoning to play well is preserving a creature. So let's say you played a big and powerful creature. It's given you great value over time, but over time it's obviously become weaker either because it's taken damage or it's become debuffed in one way, shape, or form. So for example, let's say you have a taunt creature with eight health, but over time it's been reduced to two. Now it's gonna die in your opponent's next turn. So what you should do is try and attack with it one more time and then level up summon over top of it. That way you have that base to basically power up your future summoned creature and that's a way to kind of just prolong its value moving forward over time. Now this tactic is great because it could possibly waste your opponent's time, creatures, or resources because they basically throw in their stuff at it and they couldn't kill it and they just level up summon over top of it and just basically make the new creature just as strong possibly as it was beforehand. So Regardless of how you use your level up summoning, you always want to make sure you get as much value from the card before you perform a level up summon. That means you want to either attack with it or use your magia skills because when you perform a level up summon, that creature now is gone and you don't have anything in play. So you may not be able to actually play your magia skills. So make sure you use them before you perform the level up summon and also attack with that base creature before you actually summon over top of them. Now, dealing damage to gifted grants magia points. So every time a gifted takes damage, whether self-inflicted or from your opponent, they gain magia points. So this can lead to an interesting scenario because you can't necessarily rush or zerg down your opponent by playing quick, fast cards because you're basically going to be giving them magia points and enabling them to actually drop those big and powerful creatures or spells much more quickly than normally they would have. So just keep this in mind, especially at the beginning of the game. You don't want to give your opponent free magia points. Like if you're doing like say one or two damage, is it worth doing that amount of damage? Because you're giving them that much magia points and they could possibly play a lot more out of their hand than normally would have been. Granted, you can kind of bait your opponent into this by giving them lots of magic points and kind of tricking them to playing lots and then you counter and just wipe their board. But the point of the matter is you don't want to give your opponent too big of a magic point lead at the beginning of the game because they may gain board control and therefore just kind of snowball themselves to victory over time. Because like I said, let's say in the early game, I dealt seven damage to my opponent really quickly. But that means just they gain seven magic points and they can drop a big 10 cost card out of nowhere basically and then just kind of throw all of my... Um, advantage as well as possibly removing multiple cards of a single one. Abusing instant summoning. So I've mentioned how when you set a creature it's kind of invulnerable it takes a turn to actually activate. However if you can abuse this fact and basically summon them instantly you can do lots of exciting things. Now playing rush cards is an example. When you play a rush style card you basically gain their effect you basically get to play them immediately. It's kind of more surprising but it obviously costs a bit more magia points to compensate for that. However, you there are magia skills as well as spells and possibly even creature effects that allows you to summon a set creature instantly. Now, obviously you can use that on your own creatures to basically transform any creature into a rush style creature. It's great for when you want to surprise your opponent with extra damage or also even end the game earlier than they expected. However, instantly summoning your opponent's set creatures may be more valuable. So when your opponent plays a set creature, they're thinking, well, it's invulnerable, kind of. I'm going to be kind of safe. This is great. But if you can forcefully summon their creature, they still get their on summon effect. So that mimic would have still dealt two damage to its opposing creature, but they can't actually utilize their creature. They can't attack of it. They can't benefit from their typings for their magia skills. So forcefully summoning a set creature or your opponent is allowing you to basically remove that card from play before it gets to actually have its full effect or full value. And that can actually be very powerful and it's one of the stronger strategies. And is why certain um, gifted are very popular because one of their magia skills allows you to basically forcefully summon a creature and allows you to trade um, favorably with your opponent because they don't get to actually utilize their creature or card to their fullest extent. So what should you first do in Chrono Magia? Well, I'm assuming you've read this guide thus far, so you have a little, at least a bit of knowledge. But the first thing you should do is obviously make sure you have a reasonable starting um, pack or packs overall. Get at least a bunch of rares and hopefully a super rare, and then you can kind of go on your way. But what you should do before you jump into the um, um, constructed play is what you should do is you should play through the story mode. Playing through the story mode is a great gentle introduction because you can play at your own pace. There's no timer limit. You can play slowly. You can read all the cards and take your time. 
Furthermore, your opponents initially are very weak and obviously lackluster, so it gives you a chance to basically win and feel good about yourself. Furthermore, when you play through story mode, you unlock various achievements, so you get more cards, you get suits, you get magic gold, you get a wide variety of helpful things. So this is very amazing and important because it's going to give you a gentle introduction to the game while building up your resources overall. So if you play through all four of the story modes, you get four packs, you get a bunch of Magia Gold, you also get a bunch of suits, as well as a better understanding of the game. It will also showcase you lots of common and rare creatures and cards, so you have an idea of how they play and interact. So you are able to kind of maybe, once you start deck building on your own, have a little bit better understanding. So I would strongly encourage you to play through the story mode before you do anything else, because it's the easiest way to basically rack up cards and Magia Gold overall, as well as being the easiest introduction. Furthermore, if you do fail in the final chapters, which is possible because it does get a little more difficult, you can just keep retrying. There's no limit to the amount of tries you can take, just your amount of patience you have. And also, in story mode, the decks you play with are fixed, so you don't have to worry about deck building whatsoever yet. So, basic deck building. So, deck building definitely could have its own article. It could be very long. Like, this article is already 5,100 words, so I don't want to make it obviously too long. But I want to basically just give you some basic deck building tips and strategies. So... If you are a veteran to these trading card games um, genre, it will be a little bit easier because you can kind of see synergies overall. However, in this game here, if you're very new, what I would suggest is either you pick a couple of core cards to build around or you pick Magia skills you want to build around. However, if even that feels overwhelming, what you can do is take the preset decks they've already made and then swap out the weaker cards for stronger alternatives. However, you still should preserve the typing of the deck. So for example, if you remove a common club card and put in, say, a rare or super rare club card, make sure, sorry, card, make sure the new card you put in also has the club typing to kind of preserve the integrity of the deck's um, Magia skill typing. So let's say you started the game and you have a couple of cool legendaries you want to use and you want to build a deck around it. Well, you need to first basically um, see what type of what typing they have and where they can play. So let's say you have two different legendaries and one's a spade and one's a club typing and as well as other let's say construct and dragon let's say. You want to find Magia skills that line up with those spades and club typing overall. So this like basically allows you to have, utilize the filter and basically find other complementing creatures with the same typing and build a deck that kind of synergizes around it and then you find Magia skills or gifted that actually utilize that um, typing. Conversely, the other way to go about this, once you have, say, like a larger collection overall, what you do is you look at the Magia skills you want to use and build a deck based around that. So let's say, for example, we're going to use the Magia skills display here. We need to have diamonds, spades, and constructs. And those are the only three types we should really try and fill our deck with. And we'll have great synergy with our Magia skills and also having a deck that will function and work well enough. So those are kind of like the two ways to kind of just start basic deck building. However, I do want to discuss spells versus creatures. So when you are building your deck, you want to have a healthy mixture of spells to creatures. But there is distinct differences. Creatures take time to play. You have to set them and then they take action. However, they tend to have more value if you are able to play them and keep them alive for more than one turn. Obviously playing a creature, killing one and having it killed the next turn, same net effect, but it's obviously a bit slower. So the key is you wanna have your creatures actually survive and live long enough to see a second turn, take a second action, and basically give you more value overall. On the other hand, spell cards are instantaneous. As soon as you play the spell, you gain the effect, you gain the benefit, and that can allow you to basically gain an advantage over your opponent because it's much quicker. And also their magia point cost is a little lower than a rush creature. Because let's say you want to play a rush creature to gain an instantaneous benefit. It's going to cost you more magia points to actually play that rush creature compared to playing a spell card. So that is important to consider. Like, do you want to put a rush creature out or do you want to play an instant spell to kill something? It depends really on the scenario. But again, this is why spells can excel. However, you should only use spells for either removing enemy creatures that were too hard to deal with otherwise or ending the game. You should never, ever, ever play a spell card just to hit your opponent's gifted unless you have a plan in your head to end the game very shortly after because you've essentially played a card and it's gone forever and you didn't get that much value out of it. You didn't trade up. You didn't remove any threat. So just keep that in mind. Whereas a rush creature into your opponent's gifted face may be a little better if it can live for at least another turn. So... 
don't overpopulate your deck with spells, but have some available because it allows you to kind of have quote unquote get out of jail free cards because you can play something and remove threats instantly instead of waiting for them to build up over time. So choosing your starting hand. So now that you've got a decent deck to play with, how do you go about choosing your starting hand? And the simplest answer, knowing nothing about your deck or synergy or strategy whatsoever, is look at your tier one Magia skill. If your tier one Magia skill requires you to have a spade, you wanna keep a spade card at least, and it's ideally a spade card that you could play right away because you start the game with a varying amount of Magia points and you regenerate them on your turn. So just remember, you're gonna regenerate some at the start of your first turn. So you wanna make sure you can at least play something as well as being able to unlock your Magia skills after that creature is summoned. And that's kind of just the most basic general advice I can give for choosing your starting hand. What to spend your suit pieces on. So as I mentioned earlier, suit pieces are another type of currency that is acquired from either breaking down cards or completing achievements and login bonuses. You can't purchase them directly. So with that in mind, what should we spend our suit pieces on? Like you can definitely craft yourself a powerful card or a series of cards, but the problem is we don't know what the meta is going to be. So I would not craft cards yet because we don't know what are gonna be the stronger decks overall. Because furthermore, those cards may not have as much value suddenly, or you might actually open that creature up in a pack in the future and you'd be kind of sad if you don't want to actually have two or mo more duplicates of that same creature. So this is why I would possibly suggest purchasing a new gifted. Purchasing a new gifted consumes your suit pieces, but they are a permanent investment that cannot go bad. You can purchase a gifted and you can't get gifted any other way. You're not going to be you can't open a pack and suddenly get a gifted. So purchasing a gifted with your suit pieces is a permanent investment that's not gonna go bad. It can also open up new strategies and synergies for the cards you have available. So don't rush into doing this right away. Just plan it out and see what you have at your disposal. There's no rush to purchase or spend your suit pieces. You can hoard and save them up and see what comes out over time. So now we come to like some basic gameplay strategies. So you obviously wanna try and ensure that your cards trade up. So this is obviously achieved through experience as well as understanding how the game mechanics work. So I wanna explain why trading up and card advantage is important. So let's say for example, we've gone through half of your deck and your opponent's gone through half of their deck as well. And you have one creature on the board as well as three cards in hand. Your opponent has um, one creature on the board as well and only two cards in hand. So you have a one card advantage. So let's say for the rest of the game, everything trades one for one. Like you spend one card here to remove one, they remove what your card, so on and so forth. At the end, you'll have one card more than your opponent. So that card advantage allowed you to basically win the game at the very end. So obviously if you can push that card advantage to even bigger limits, you can have a much easier time to win overall. So this is obviously a very simplified scenario and lots of things can change, but it's just a good general understanding of how these trading card games work. You wanna have card advantage, you wanna have board control, and you wanna basically trade up whenever possible. So with that in mind, you want to use your Magia skills as much as possible because Magia skills are forever. You can use them every single turn provided you have those typing on the board. And that way you can gain value without actually wasting a card. So for example, let's say you have an opposing creature with two health and you have a Magia skill that can do two damage or you have a spell card that can do two damage. Always, always, always play them, use the Magia skill and not the spell because that spell card will still be in your hand the next turn. But if you played it now, you won't be able to access that spell card otherwise anymore. It's gone. And furthermore, that Magia skill is always going to be there, but you can use it every single turn. So try to use Magia skills first and foremost before losing a card or a spell or a creature in any way, if possible. So another point to consider is defending creatures do not fight back. So this is kind of strange to me because I'm used to Hearthstone where you attack a creature. If it survives, it hits you back and does damage based on their attack value. In Chronomagia, that's not the case. You can basically kind of zerg a high health creature with lots of small ones and they don't have to worry about being retaliated back. Three creatures can gang up and beat down one over time and none of them die uh, because defending creatures don't fight back. So with that in mind, you can always want to trade into your opponent's creatures because you want to deal damage to them and try and remove them if at all possible. So this is an important thing. It's kind of a bit surprising and also kind of somewhat lowers the value of taunt creatures that have high attack and modest health. They almost You almost want taunt creatures to have tons of health so they just absorb as much punishment as possible because they don't fight back anyways. 
Now, board control. So board control is basically a term or a concept of controlling the board more than your opponent. If you have board control, you have more creatures on the board than your opponent does, you can kind of keep snowballing this advantage over time. Now, this advantage is definitely preserved by um, summoning their set creatures, basically to remove them so they never can get anything on the board. They can't build up any momentum. They can't get level up summons going, that sort of idea. So you want to make sure you control the board, but don't overinvest because there are lots of multiple removal cards. Like there are common cards or rare cards that do three damage to all opposing creatures. You don't want to overpopulate your board and have them all wiped out by a single card. That's trading down from your end. But you want to obviously control the board if at all possible. And obviously this is important for setting up lethal turns. You think, well, next turn I could do five damage to my opponent, but if I put another creature down there, the next turn I would have eight damage and that might be enough to push and win the game. So just keep that in mind. Like think of how you can actually end and win the game. And now be mindful of gifted damage. Basically, like I said already, every time the gifted takes damage, they gain one Magia point. So at the beginning of the game, if you over damage your opponent, you're not gonna end the game on the first couple of turns, but you're just giving them lots of magic points. So they might slam down a big power card and wipe out several of your smaller ones in one go. That's obviously bad because then you've lost board control, you've lost multiple cards at the expense of their one card, as well as them basically be able to possibly even snowball themselves and start punishing you more intensely. So just be mindful and don't always think you have to hit their face or they're gifted because you are giving them free magic points. For example, let's say you have, you're kind of fighting for board control and you have some leftover damage, but you notice your opponent has zero magia points left. Instead of just going for their face with that leftover damage, let it ride out. You're, that way you don't give them extra magia points. They can't play their bigger, more powerful cards. And you kind of build up your board control advantage over time. And then when you have more, you unload it all at once. Because remember, the magia point limit is 15. And if you suddenly do so much damage to your opponent, they might just waste those magia points anyways because they go over the limit of 15. So in conclusion, Chrono Magia is a, the newest game to be introduced by Gung Ho. And I think it's quite exciting and fun, partially because it's new as well as providing a nice twist on trading card games. Now, as I already mentioned before, it's obviously best to start the game as soon as possible because you get those um, launch celebration login rewards as well as being basically keeping abreast of all the current trends because there's no current trend necessarily yet. You're on the cutting edge of power creep. Whereas if you start this game a year later, you might be more overwhelmed because there's more creatures to learn about, more spells to learn about, and more strategies and synergies that have evolved over time, and it may be harder to catch up. So depending on the reception of this article, I may or may not continue making Chrono Magia content moving forward. Let me know what you think about this game in the comments below and whether or not you found this reference guide helpful. Hopefully you all have a fantastic day. I wish you all the best of luck in your own Chrono Magia adventures and happy magia -ing? I don't know what to say. I need a new tagline. Let me know if you think of one.